So my name is Jane Franzak. I'm a physical therapist and I have been a PT for forever, 30 years. Um, in my time I've seen orthopedic patients. So those typical things that you tend to think of, neck pain, back pain, hips, knees, um, joint replacements. But then I also have a specialty in uh, myofascial release, which is a form of body work that helps you to relieve pain. And I have a board certification as a pelvic floor women's health therapist. So um, men and women who have incontinence, pelvic pain, painful intercourse, basically anything that can happen to you from like here to here is my realm and where my specialty is. So um, I worked for myself at a company called Serendip PT down at Evergreen. And um, I just wanna thank you all for coming out. So, I don't like being filmed, even though I'm filming myself. So I got my cheat sheet, so sorry if I'm looking down, but I don't like being filmed. So we're gonna talk about nutrition today, and uh, you may be wondering why a physical therapist is talking to you about nutrition. So the American Physical Therapy Association really endorses that we, as healthcare providers, talk to our clients about ways to stay healthy and about alternatives to surgery and medication or natural ways to get better. So we want a conservative approach to pain. So why am I, as a physical therapist, talking to you about this? So again, as I said, I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist and I typically talk to people about what their intake and their output is every day. I talk to them about their lifestyle choices. I'm talking to them about um, what they're doing that comes in their mouth, how it comes out, and what they're doing during the time that they're not in the clinic with me. So my background is that I have a lot of knowledge with what we eat and how it gets processed and how it should come out. So things that I work with are constipation, urinary and fecal leakage, um, bloating, gas, irritable bowel syndrome, bladder pain, endometriosis, chronic urinary tract infections, fibromyalgia, uh, painful intercourse, non-relaxing pelvic floors, chronic fatigue, and things called vaginismus or vulvodynia. In addition to treating people who have pain anywhere from their top of their head to the bottom of their toes. So with that in mind, let's talk about digestion. So everybody has some food in front of them so normally you're gonna take that food or beverage, it goes into your mouth, your digestive enzymes start to process that food. It goes into your stomach and moves through the body, more digestive enzymes start to process it and break it down into smaller pieces. We then absorb those nutrients that are useful for us, we get rid of the waste products and we excrete that. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, it's not always that easy. So things can go wrong. Sometimes that food is not easily digested by us and we're not processing that very well. So we have bloating, belching, gas, feeling like you're excessively full, you really didn't eat a lot of food, or like it's just sitting there in your gut. Sometimes we have acne or rosacea. You may have food allergies where you really can't tolerate certain foods like eggs or dairy products. You may have flatulence no matter what you eat. So why does that happen? Sometimes it's because as we're aging, the digestive processes slow down. A lot of times it's stress. Sometimes it's because of infections in our body. Perhaps it's medications that we take like antacids, which actually have a negative effect on our body. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Advil and improper food preparation. So since I mentioned antacids, let's talk about that. Sometimes people will eat something and it doesn't really feel good in their belly, so they go reach for their Tums. Tums decreases the acid in their stomach. We're supposed to have acid in our stomach. Your stomach is supposed to be acidic. Your small intestine is not. That should not be acidic. So when we put Tums to calm the acid down in our stomach, we're actually making our stomach create more acid. 
So it's not a really good thing to have. It might have made you feel better in the moment, but in the long run, relying on antacids is adversely affecting your body. I mentioned proper food preparation. So in front of you, you have walnuts. So the way I prepared those walnuts is making them more digestible. Typically when you get walnuts or any kind of nuts from the store, they're going to roast those nuts at 450 degrees for about 15 or 20 minutes. Unfortunately, the coating around the nut, which is called phytic acid, remains on the nut. So if you've ever eaten a bunch of nuts and you sometimes feel like you're really gassy and full, the next day you don't feel good, or maybe you find undigested nut in your stool, it's because you didn't digest them. What I did with these nuts was that I soaked them in a salt bath for 15, or a tablespoon of salt, and I covered the nuts and I soaked them for eight hours. Then I patted them dry and I put them in a baking pan and roasted them overnight for about nine hours. They taste differently and they're di more digestible. So you can ro soak nuts and roast them. You can do this with cashews, almonds, um, of course, walnuts, uh, pecans. I'm not so sure about thicker nuts like a Brazil nut, but I'm sure you could find something like that online. But I'll tell you, my children love these nuts. They will eat these things till, they're, till the container's gone. If I buy them at the store, my kids rarely ever go for them. So see what you think. So food preparation. So let's talk about our gut microbiota. Has anybody ever heard of that? So it's another word for a lost organ in our body. It's another endocrine organ. It has a great effect on our overall health. We find our gut microbiota in our intestines. It's like a second brain for our enteric nervous system. Half of our nerves are contained in our gut. So you know when you get up like me and I'm standing in front of a crowd, sometimes you feel like you have to go to the bathroom or your stomach gets upset. Your enteric nervous system is acting up and causing you to feel some discomfort. Many people who have uh, degenerative brain diseases have GI or gastrointestinal issues because these nerves that are in our intestines are connected to our brain. There's a direct link and a direct correlation. Um, poor digestion and constipation are signs of an issue with your enteric nervous system. Uh, I have a research article in front of me that's called Mind-Altering Microorganisms, The Impact of Microbiota on Brain and Behavior, written in 2012 by, by Cryan. What is clear is that there is communication between the gut microbiota and the central nervous system. The neuroendocrine, the neuroimmune, and the sympathetic and parasympathetic arms of our autonomic nervous system and enteric nervous system are key pathways that, uh, through which they communicate with each other. So the GI tract is the scaffolding for the communication between our gut and our brain. 70% of our immune cells live in our gut. We have to feed our gut flora. It's like a garden in our gut. Trillions of bacteria live in there. Three to six pounds worth of bacteria live in our gut and they're good bacteria. We want them in there. They're friendly microbes, which are helping to digest what we eat so that we can absorb them and utilize the nutrients. So um, peristalsis, that is the way that food or a bolus of uh, material that we've eaten moves through our intestines. So our intestines are squeezing that food through. The microbiota is helping with that peristalsis. They help to maintain the mucosal lining, the mucosal integrity of the intestinal system. They control the pH in the intestinal system and they help protect us against invading pathogens like viruses. So key points to keep in mind that stress greatly impairs our digestion because it shunts blood away from our intestinal system and it reduces digestive system, uh, digestive juices and our mucus production. So things slow down and become like sludge inside our gut when we have stress. Fat and cholesterol get a bad rap, but we're supposed to have fat and cholesterol. 
They're necessary for the integrity of every one of the cells of our body. All of the membranes need fat and cholesterol. Our intestinal tract is a tube inside which are brush, little brushes called our brush border. And they're supposed to keep invaders out and protect the mucosal lining. So fat and cholesterol help to build that villi or intestinal mucosa that's in there. So there are differences between certain fats and certain cholesterols, but we're gonna come back to that. So just know that we need them. We need to eat those foods. And our healthy microbiota is needed to absorb nutrients and for our digestion. So how can you have a good digestive system? Probably everybody in here is doing it. You need to exercise. So by having exercise with aerobics and weight training, you're building muscle. And by building muscle, that is going to help your strength in your entire system. When you have decreased strength, your intestinal peristalsis, the squeezing of the food that goes through the tubes, slows down and the bad bacteria can proliferate. Exercise also leads to better moods, better sleep, decreased anxiety, and decreased stress, helping out your digestive system. Having a good lifestyle is another way to help your digestion. So having good sleep, having good social activities like you all are doing here today, learning new things, playing games like pickleball, getting out there and you know, at interacting like the Y encourages you to do. It also strengthens your memory. It helps your immunity and helps your heart and brain and digestion. So let's talk about our diet a little bit. How many people think that it would be a really good idea to send your grandchildren or your children out the door on Lucky Charms with all of the little marshmallows, hearts, moon, stars, um, a pack of M&Ms, then for lunch, pack their lunch up with Doritos, some more M&Ms, um, a soda, and then have them come home for a snack. You've got a big old thing of Dunkin' Donuts coffee and a thing of um, munchkins. And then for dinner, serve them up, oh, let's see, some chocolate chip cookies and, um, I don't know, Cheetos. Does that sound good? Well, I woke up this morning and I found an article, front page of my e email, and I'm livid about it. So the Friedman School of Nutrition and Science and policy food comp policies food compass is something that's been unleashed in 2021 and they are labeling foods and rating foods according to their healthiness and their goodness for us. And they're going to be talking to the White House in September of 2022, coming right up. They have rated frosted mini wheats as three times better than ground beef with a score of 87 out of 100. And ground beef is 26. Right? They have said that eggs, cheddar cheese, and beef are worse for you than frosted mini wheats, unsweetened almond milk, um, honey nut Cheerios, sweet potatoes, sweet potato fries or chips, Lucky Charms, and they put whole eggs fried in butter, cheddar cheese and ground beef at the bottom of the list. So the ones I mentioned first with all the sugars and the fries are all these lines up here. And the foods that we typically think are healthy are down here. Can you imagine on the day of this talk, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So, so keep an eye out, it's from Tufts University. I went to school in Boston. Tufts was right down the road. Yeah. Tufts University has unleashed this. So be aware because they are ignoring fundamental science, fundamental knowledge that we've all known. If you have food that's fried, which everybody here on the Eastern Shore likes to do with their seafood, you have deep fried, I don't know, fish and french fries. The way they prepared the food, even though it's fish and it's potatoes, that fried food creates linoleic acid, which your liver hates. It has a horrible time 
being able to process, and it's going to lead to cardiovascular disease as well as neurovascular diseases, dementia, things like that, heart attacks. So be aware of this group, the Food Compass out of Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition. Don't be misled, because we all know otherwise. We've all been eating probably better than we think we have, better than they think we have. So don't forget what we've all learned as this new information comes out. Instead, maybe we should go for a Mediterranean diet which is more fruits and vegetables, legumes, whole grains, fish, dairy, olive oil. This leads to improved mentation, improved memory, improved immunity, and stronger bones. Fermented foods like yogurt, kefir, kombucha, um, sauerkraut, kimchi, all gives you probiotics, and probiotics help you to digest your food and feed your flora. Eating nutrient-rich meals that create enzymes in your body or even have enzymes themselves. Papaya, pineapple, bitters. I don't know if anybody's parents ever gave them bitters when you have an upset stomach. Mm -hmm. Those are great, they have probiotics in them. Nuts, dairy products, proteins like grass-fed beef, cold water fish, so there's fish that come from Alaska, areas like that. Um, foods that are gonna give you amino acids are gonna feed your small intestine. As I said before, we do want some fats and oils. We want about nine calories per gram. We need that for our gut, our brain, our sexual health. They form our cell membranes. They, they're a precursor to vitamin D and they're a precursor to our sex hormones. The body can make cholesterol, but it stresses the body out to do it. So why not give the body a little help, you know? Uh, one note, triglycerides are not a measure of fat. They're a measure of sugar. So keep that in mind when they talk about your blood work that triglycerides seem to come up in the fat category, but they're not a measure of fat. They're a measure of your sugar. So can we eat foods that help us or foods that hinder our healing? Absolutely, we can. Healthy physiology is supported by the nutrients that we take into our body. So foods that hinder, they've become really prevalent in our society because we really want to get out there and go fast and have convenience. As a healthcare provider, it's my duty to inform people who I come in contact with, mostly my patients, of the adverse effect that it will have on your physiology. When I'm trying to make positive changes in their body and help their pain to feel better, I have to talk about nutrition because that's going to adversely affect them or enhance what I'm working on. So one thing to avoid is the standard American diet. We have flour and cereal. We have added fats, cooking oils, shortening, added sugar, processed food. We have refined foods like white breads, pasta, instant rice, bagels, and corn cereals or high glycemic foods, those foods that are high in sugar. Um, foods like margarine instead of butter, corn and seed oils. So cotton seed oils, rape seed oils. We should avoid those kind of things. They're some of the worst that we can eat. Or those foods with long shelf lives. They're gonna live forever, like chips and crackers. Every now and then have them, but not on a regular basis. That's not something to live on. What we should eat more of are cold water fish, walnuts, green leafy vegetables, <coughs> bone broths. Anybody familiar with bone broths? Mm -hmm. So taking that carcass of your chicken that maybe you made for dinner, boiling that down, put some herbs in there and some seasonings, continue to cook that down, and then you can use that broth in other recipes or you can have a little snack and drink that down. Anybody know what that's going to do for you? What do those bone broths do? Collagen. That's right, they give you collagen. They're gonna help to strengthen your collagen, which is the uh, like framework for all of your organs and cells. It's also going to give you proteins and amino acids, which we need, they're the building blocks of proteins. I have a recipe up here 
that you can come and get in a little while on a good recipe how to make uh, bone broth. We also want to have polyphenols. So in front of you, you have a beautiful purple type of uh, smoothie. You have green cucumbers, um, maybe some grapes that are green and some purple strawberry or grapes. We have red watermelon. And a little spinach in your smoothie. There you go. Taste it. So these naturally colored foods give us polyphenols. Those are very good for us. We also get antioxidants from them. So it neutralizes those types of bad chemicals that are coming into our cells. So they, the antioxidants are going to help us against aging and cellular damage. So again, greens, orange, reds. Also having black tea or green tea, those are very good for you too. Tea gets a bad rap, but you know, tea is really good for you. So drink your iced tea, put some lemon in it. Don't necessarily put sugar in, but those are really good foods to have. Great afternoon snack. We want foods with fiber. So they're soluble and insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber, or all fiber is really roughage. So soluble fiber is going to digest in water. It's going to be absorbed in water. Um, soluble is, things like nuts and oats and lentils. They're gonna form a gel. Anybody ever put flax seeds in their smoothie and it gets kind of gelatinous, kind of gooey? That's soluble fiber. That's what we expect. Think about when that hits your gut. It's like a toothbrush. It's gonna grab all that stuff and pull it out. Pulls everything with it. Insoluble fiber does not dissolve in water. Think about um, vegetables and fruits like apples or celery. You have a hard time breaking those down in water. We also want to intake probiotics for our gut flora, as we talked about. Fatty acids through grass-fed butter. Butter is good, margarine is not. Coconut oil, take a spoon of that, put that in your smoothie or put that in your coffee. You can use coconut oil to clean your makeup off your face, to brush your teeth with. Coconut oil is amazing, has amazing qualities. So try to incorporate more of that into your diet. We also have spices that have anti-inflammatory effects. So ginger, rosemary, turmeric, oregano, cayenne, clove, nutmeg. Also, there are herbs that are anti-inflammatory. Feverfew, we use those for headaches. They can decrease the inflammation in our brain and really help to make your head feel a lot better. So thinking about reading labels, before I was a physical therapist, I was a cosmetic chemist. So I helped to develop liquid makeup and mascara over at Noxell, which is now Procter & Gamble. So I learned how to read labels. I was always sitting there at my dinner table, seeing what was in anything that I ate, because that's what I did for work, was read those labels before we developed the products. So don't be fooled by the big letters on the outside that says like, you know, zero grams of sugar or um, no added sugars. Look on the back, it probably has aspartame or something in it, but, or zero calories. So don't be fooled by what's on the front in the big letters. That's a sales pitch. Turn it around and read the back, read the label. The first ingredient that, list, that is listed is the one that is in the highest quantity. So for a lot of our lotions and soaps, you're gonna see water is the biggest ingredient. For our cereals, you're probably gonna see sugar, sugar. Sugar, sugar. Try finding a cereal on the market that doesn't have a bunch of sugar in it. It's gonna to be tough. Um, so if the first ingredient listed is not helpful or real, like in your dog or cat food, chicken byproduct. What is byproduct? <laughs> I'm not buying that stuff for my animals. I don't know what it is, I'm not eating it, I'm not giving it to them, byproduct. That's the first ingredient on my cat's food, or that those cat's foods, I don't eat that, I don't have them eat it. Avoid partially hydrogenated oils. High fructose corn syrup. If you don't have sugar on your label, you probably have high fructose corn syrup. If you spot these, leave them on the shelf and walk away. Avoid foods with a long ingredient list. There's a whole bunch of additives to them. And that can be tricky because they hide stuff inside of all of those other ingredients. The fewer the ingredients, the better off you are. So something like a Lara bar, I think it has, let's say the cherry one might have cashews, apples, cherries, and some cinnamon. Boom, done. 
great product to eat, gives you good nutrition. Fiber is a friend. Look for things that have fiber. We want 25 grams per day. Fruits, vegetables, fill yourself up with those kind of things. Best strategy is to choose wholesome whole foods that don't require a label. Not Lucky Charms and whatever else. Limit your sugar. Sugar depresses your immunity, sours your behavior and your attention and your learning. Think about what happens to our kids when you give them sugar. They go crazy and then they calm down, they feel awful. It increases your glycemic index. It promotes cravings and it causes or it leads to heart disease. High fructose corn syrup causes more sugar cravings. Now let's talk about artificial sugar, aspartame. It tastes awful. It's terrible for you. It probably should be taken off the market. It's a neurotoxin. So when it says no sugar, be sure that there's no sugar substitute too. Good things to keep in mind. Trans fats, we talked about partially hydrogenated oils. They're found in cookies, crackers, chips, pastries, bagels, donuts, peanut butter that's like Jiffy and Skip. Go for something that's natural at the Amish market. Those fake coffee creamers, that's not cream, it's, um, I can't think, it's oils. Yeah, I can't think of the ones that, they taste really good. Those international food ones, but they're awful for you. Soup, fast food, candy, margarine, salad dressing. I don't know if anybody remembers back in probably like the late 80s, there were all of these low fat foods they came out. So they took your um, ranch dressing and they're like low fat ranch or cookies that were low fat and they put all this other stuff in there and you take the lid off your ranch dressing and there's all this crud around it and it didn't taste the same or everything had margarine instead and it didn't taste as good. So think about those original ingredients that we all grew up eating is really where we want to stay, but we want to limit our intake of them. You don't certainly want to slather butter all over everything, but if it's a choice between butter and margarine, go for the butter. If it's a choice between non-fat ranch dressing and ranch dressing, go for the regular ranch, just don't use as much. The more natural the ingredient is, the better it is for you. How about colors with numbers? Red number 40, yellow number five. Don't eat those things. Um, preservatives. So when you look on your ingredient list all the way at the end, you're going to have MSG, ETTA, BHT, benzoate, and they're all the way at the end because there's just a little portion of them and they're preservatives, but you want to try to have the least amount of preservatives in your food. Basically, those chemicals that are added are wreaking havoc on our body. Avoid soft drinks, especially diet soft drinks. Soft drinks are not very good for us. Um, there's a lot of sugar, there's a lot of color. Some people like the carbonation, that's great. And it's nice that we've got some alternative things like um, LaCroix water. So it gives you the bubbles, but without having all those calories and the sugar. Avoid packaged bakery goods. Bake them at home you're gonna have much more natural ingredients in them. But when you go home with like Little Debbie's donuts, those things are, in a, that's not even food. It's like cardboard with some powdered sugar in a, in a bag. So what's gonna help heal? Well, clean water. There's a lot of talk these days about there's water that's in our um, city water that's really not good for us. Has anybody ever heard of one of those Berkey filters? It's like a big, cylinder that sits on your countertop, that thing will filter out huh, viruses, bacteria. You could take pond water and pour it in a Berkey filter and it comes out with clean water. You can put red food dye in that and it comes out without the red dye because it's got charcoal filters. So that's something you might be able to purchase. You can sometimes put a filter on your sink underneath or on the top and get yourself some really good clean water good clean whole foods as we've talked about. Having good cultured foods are going to help us. So cultured foods, again, that 
um, coleslaw, sauerkrauts, um, pickled peppers, and even cucumbers are really good as fermented food. Um, sauerkraut, that's what I was thinking of. That's a great one too. Proteins that are from animal and plant sources. Did you know that peas are a really good source of protein? Put some peas on your salad next time you're up at Harris Teeter. Throw a couple of them on there. Uh, try to stick to foods that have low glycemic index. Try to prepare your foods properly, soaking and then roasting, or even have soaking and sprouted wheat, grains, and that's gonna help you when you make bread to be able to have a more nutritious loaf of bread. Even sourdough bread is better for you than regular white bread. There's temperature considerations too to our food. So having like a, a well done steak versus a medium rare steak or burger is going to be better for you. You can digest that better. And then having the gelatins and the bone broth. So gelatin is really a powder, a protein that's made into a powder. You can add that to your smoothies, your stews, your soups, and there's lots of recipes online so that you can include that gelatin in there. And it's gonna really give you a lot of good collagen and help your body. It's flavorless. It does tend to set up and get gelled a little bit, but you know, if you mix that up and you drink that pretty quickly, you don't get to the gel part. So get your resilience through your nutrition. Also, I want you to look at things like ginger, pineapple, tart cherries, red grapes, extra virgin olive oil, thyme, salmon, and fish oils. Make those things part of your diet. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is foods that are gonna help your conditions. So osteoporosis, not a one in us in here gets to escape that. Osteoporosis is when our bones become more fragile and weaker. Kefir or fermented yogurts can help you. If you can't do dairy, you can take the kefir crystals and add that to other liquids like coconut milk or almond milk and it will still ferment. It uses the sugars in those milks to make probiotics. So drinking down some kefir, if you don't like yogurt, drink down some kefir and that can really help get probiotics in your system. Uh, there's a term called third age woman that I had come across. I had never heard that before, but that would be the perimenopause or just around menopause women. We wanna avoid drinking out of plastic containers. So reusing those water bottles that we all pick up at the store, use it once and get rid of it. Don't let it get hot in your car. It creates xenoestrogens um, and we know that excess estrogen can help lead to cancers. Women between 45 and 50 should eat lots of cruci cruciferous vegetables. So our Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, good sourced proteins, grass fed beef, oily fish, free range chickens, and lots of fats. Men, prostate issues, avoid basically the Western sweets and beverages. Lots of pasta, lots of sauce, pizza, cookies, muffins, donuts, cakes, pastries, pies, oatmeal, cream of wheat, breakfast cereals, chips, corn chips, popcorn, tortillas, ice cream, glass of milk, carbonated beverages, and soft drinks. All the fun stuff. Do those in limitation. Have those as a treat on the side. How about pain? Condition of pain. Try to reduce or eliminate foods that promote, promote um, systemic inflammation. So those things that have high glycemic loads, those things that are very sugary.